Um, so intangibles are at the very heart of our business. Well, of course, we say that people are our most important asset, uh, which is certainly the case. But uh, we have very few physical assets, and almost all of our um, uh, assets are intangible. So I'd like to cover a few issues, and uh, please do feel free to ask me any questions as we go through, um, if you'd like to. Um, I'd like to talk about the tax treatment of IP in general and IP holding companies, uh, some issues that arise in M&A transactions, uh, trademarks, copyrights, patents, know-how, um, R&D centres, uh, the transfer of marketing intangibles, business restructuring, uh, and some valuation issues. And then I'd like briefly to touch on the digital economy, where there are some particular interesting questions about how to apply the traditional tax regime to uh, digital transactions. Well, a quick word about the general environment for tax and intangibles, first of all. Um, I, I think there has never been a time when it's been more interesting to be a part of the international tax community with so much discussion of uh, how the international tax system should work um, in relation to multinational companies. Um, there's OECD work ongoing on uh, intangibles uh, and of course the BEPS project. Now, I only heard the word BEPS um, a year or so ago, base erosion and profit shifting, and now it's at the very heart of all of our thinking um, in multinational company taxation. There's extraordinary political interest, as we know, um, the G8, the G20. If you look at the communiques from the last two meetings of the G8 and the G20, uh, taxation forms a large part of the content of the discussion of the various uh, prime ministers and um, uh, uh, politicians. Um, in the UK, I think most people around the world will have heard of Margaret Hodge, the chairman of the Public Accounts Committee, uh, and will have um, observed her grilling of the executives, particularly of large American companies, um, in, the, um, in the UK uh, House of Commons. Um, and also the House of Lords Economic Affairs Committee has conducted an inquiry into uh, corporate taxation. In the US, the same is happening. The US uh, Senate uh, Special Committee on Permanent Investigations looked into Apple's tax affairs and in other countries, in the Netherlands, there have been parliamentary discussions. Um, probably most countries have been public scrutiny. And the NGOs and other bodies are extremely interested in whether or not business is paying its fair share of tax. And uh, the ability to manage and deal with intangibles is right at the heart of this discussion. So I thought I'd begin with a short thought about how to spot an intangible asset. Uh, what is an intangible asset? And I suppose to state the obvious, this is quite difficult because by definition it is intangible. Um, now I've listed here some of the kinds of intangible that people talk about. There is no definitive categorization of intangible assets, I think. So we, we're familiar with patents, trademarks, copyrights, uh, trade names, know-how, uh, goodwill, uh, business opportunity. Uh, one could debate whether a business opportunity is an intangible asset. It's certainly something which is of value and which could be paid for. Whether it's part of other intangible assets or stands alone is a debating point. Um, workforce in place. Now, we know that some countries like the US have promoted the idea for some years that the workforce in place is a valuable asset. A company will have invested over the years in assembling a team of specialised and talented individuals to carry on the, the company's um, key functions, and that in itself is a valuable asset. Now, I'll talk a little later about a case where the workforce in place could, in relation to some functions, consist of just one individual. <coughs> So is that one individual a business asset quite apart from his or her status as an employee? Um, competitive advantage, brand, business secrets, location advantages, databases, um, and many more. Uh, many people have all kinds of novel ways of describing intangible assets. Um, there's, uh, this is not a new question. Um, this has been debated for years and years. Th there is an English law case, uh, Whiteman Smith Motor Company Limited against uh, Chaplin from 1934, when the judge talked about goodwill. And he said there are three kinds of goodwill. There's uh, dog, cat, and rabbit goodwill. And uh, dog goodwill is very attached to its owner. 
So if the owner of a business moves, the, the dog goodwill will follow along and stay with the owner. Uh, cat goodwill really likes the location. So if a new person takes over a business, then people will continue to come to that location um, and the cat will stay behind to keep the new owner company. And then he said there's rabbit goodwill, which as soon as anything frightening happens, it disappears down the nearest rabbit hole and you never see it again. Um, so even back in, in the 1930s in the UK, in terms of the taxation of business restructuring um, and trans M&A transactions, there were some difficulties in characterising and evaluating the tax implications of changes in intangible assets. I think it's very important in, uh, in any discussion of intangibles in a tax context to think quite hard about the legal ownership model um, because there are many things that one could do with intangible assets. You can own them and utilise them yourself. You can licence them to somebody else. You can licence them from somebody else and utilise them. Um, you can do all of those things. Um, you can cost share or jointly develop. And in some jurisdictions, joint development is not necessarily the same as cost sharing if there are more conditions attaching to uh, cost sharing or cost contribution arrangements. You can own it as an investment and sub-license it to others, not carry on the business directly at all. You can develop and sell intangibles. You can be a part owner. Uh, you could be a bare legal owner. So if a multinational enterprise decides that all of its trademarks, say, um, are going to be owned collectively by all the operating companies, but it wants one entity to be the owner of record to um, carry out any infringement actions, then one company which is the owner of record might be the bare legal owner, while all the others are the economic owners. So then we come to economic ownership, which means that you can be an economic owner <coughs> of an IP asset without being the legal owner or a, a part economic owner. Um, and then there's the concept of beneficial ownership which sometimes is used in the same way as economic ownership, uh, but in Anglo-Saxon countries it might be that a, an, a beneficial owner may be someone who has acquired an asset and owns it economically but doesn't yet own the legal title, may become the legal owner, or they may have some other um, uh, uh, interest in the asset other than the normal legal ownership. Um, so we get tremendous confusion between economic and beneficial ownership, and the OECD, I think, prefers to move away from using the expression economic ownership because it causes so much confusion. And then there's registered and unregistered um, rights in IP as well. So quite a, quite a lot of complexity and confusion here and opportunity for reasonable people to see things differently. Um, and of course, when, when we uh, as tax uh, professionals talk about these issues with accountants and lawyers and brand managers and scientists, um, the same words do mean different things. So the word brand, for example, has a very broad meaning to a, to a brand specialist. It has a, a narrower meaning to a lawyer, so something more associated with trademarks, and it might have quite a different meaning to a tax person. So a lawyer might think about protection and the actions that can be taken to protect an interest in an asset, an intangible asset, whereas a tax professional might think about the um, ability to exploit an asset uh, and earn profits from ownership or some uh, rights to use the asset, um, and that would be quite different from the perspective of a lawyer. So I, I find it, um, a, a, at the beginning of any project involving intangibles, very useful to get the lawyers, the accountants, the brand people, uh, the tax people into a room and have a, a, a general discussion about uh, what are we talking about, what do we mean when we use particular words. And if the meeting is taking place in the morning, it's a good discussion to have over a pint of beer the night before, I think, to, to get everyone in the right frame of mind. Um, well, um, business restructuring, um, so it, it, leaving tax to one side for a moment and just thinking about uh, the business, um, in a modern multinational, um, it's critical to centralise the global functions. Um, and every multinational now operates to, to a greater extent or less on a centralised basis. It's essential for economies of scale to maximise the expertise to create centres of excellence um, and that the operations be lean and efficient in, in what is a very competitive marketplace. Um, and so IP should be subject to the same considerations in terms of centralisation as any other assets or functions in the enterprise. So we should have skilled teams of professionals focused on managing the IP um, better than devolving the function to the businesses because the individuals would be that much more focused. And I think this should apply to trademarks, patents, databases, any other kind of IP. What we find, for example, is if a lawyer in the business is required to look after M&A, very exciting, employment, not exciting but very urgent when there's an issue, IP, health and safety, 
everything else, then IP and trademark registrations falls way down the list. But if we have a team who are wholly dedicated to ensuring that the IP is registered, protecting against any infringements, then they're completely focused on what they're doing and the end result will be undoubtedly better. Um, but rather than just focusing on the management of IP, I think there are benefits in centralising the ownership of IP, business benefits, um, uh, I'm referring to here rather than just tax benefits, um, in, in that people who own assets even within a multinational corporation feel an even stronger incentive to maximise the commercial value from those assets. They have an even stronger desire to protect the assets from infringements and from competitors, um, to look for new opportunities. Um, for example, one major multinational centralised the ownership of its uh, trademarks and brands, and this created an opportunity for franchising the brand outside the enterprise with third parties in a way that probably wouldn't have happened if they'd simply been managing the brand on behalf of uh, the operating companies which had previously owned it collectively. Well, so business restructuring, um, this can involve the centralization of functions, a simplification of local operations, um, and the challenges for us are to identify when valuable IP might be moving and to characterize the transaction correctly and, of course, to apply the appropriate tax treatment. And tax authorities are very concerned about the sale of IP at an undervalue, uh, non-taxable events, the emigration of IP, uh, the abuse of cost sharing um, and the abuse of transfer pricing, um, and uh, tax authorities remain very resource constrained um, and often uh, potentially overpowered by the large multinationals and their advisors. Um, so there is a, a discussion to be had here. I'd like to, to come on to talk a little about how that conversation might take place most productively. Um, I do want to just turn back for a moment. We're, we're talking really now about um, structuring the ownership of IP within multinationals. I think the business restructuring chapter uh, on the OECD transfer pricing guidelines um, is still, I say, quite new here. It's three years old, but in practice, it's still quite new. I think we're still learning how to apply it in some situations. Um, and in practice, many areas still do remain quite unclear. Um, some interesting wording <coughs> in that chapter. Um, first of all, some helpful comments. Business restructuring involved transfer of intangibles previously owned and managed by one or more local operation um, to a central location. Multinational enterprise groups may have sound business reasons to centralize ownership and management of intangible property. I think recognizing the business case, which I outlined a few moments ago. Um, however, uh, they cast a critical eye over these transactions. They say that um, uh, the arms length principle requires an evaluation of all the conditions. Um, centralization of intangible property rights may be motivated by sound commercial reasons at the level of the multinational enterprise group, or may not in some cases. Um, but that doesn't answer the question as to whether at the level of the entity the disposal is arm's length from the perspective of both the transferor and the transferee. And I think this is an area of great difficulty for us where we see something that makes sense at the level of the enterprise um, that it should also make perfect sense at the level of the individual entities involved in the business restructuring. <coughs> um, I'll, I'll be quite brief but go through the tax implications of some common transactions. I think we'll be familiar with these. So if there is a sale of IP within a multinational, there could be a taxable gain. There'll need to be evaluation, identification of the assets sold. Um, maybe there'll be amortization in the new location and the accounting needs to be thought through very carefully, particularly under IFRS where the um, deferred tax accounting is both uh, a little uh, counterintuitive and, and sometimes produces results which can be surprising from senior management. Um, licensing involves transfer pricing discussions and there needs to be clarity as to who is the licensor and who is the licensee. One thing I would say is that um, sometimes both we and our business colleagues can be discouraged from an internal transfer of IP if we feel that there is a substantial tax liability. And in a way it's unfortunate because I do think that tax shouldn't stand in the way of developments which enhance the effectiveness of a business. And generally most tax regimes have reliefs to try to avoid that happening. Um, but it can often be the case that even if there is a tax charge, which is substantial, it might still be worth doing if the business benefits are there and if amortization is available in the receiving jurisdiction to somewhat compensate for any tax charge in the disposing jurisdiction. So there's no substitute for a full economic analysis of the, the transaction. Um, it's more difficult to know what's happened where one business closes and a new business opens up somewhere else if the parties are somewhat related. 
So was there a transfer at all, or was this just a natural migration of some business activities? How would third parties have approached the situation? Would the new business owner have paid some kind of compensation to the old owner? Um, was this simply driven by business exigencies? Did the markets change? The, the customers change their, their buying habits? Um, we need to be very thoughtful if we feel there was no transfer in turning to the business to build a good business description, business case as to why that was indeed the case. Um, sometimes these things happen slowly. A uh, business winds down over a period of time. Another one is just very successful in attracting new customers. So uh, we need to be thoughtful here. Has there been some migration outside our control or is there something going on within our control that constitutes some kind of a disposal? Well, just a, a couple of quick words on IP holding companies. Um, as, uh, as, as we've heard and as we're discussing all the time now, the, uh, one of the key themes uh, these days is substance. Uh, how much substance is required for something to be legitimate? Well, many, many years ago, uh, and long before I joined uh, Reed Elsevier, but uh, in, in, in fact, many several professional lives ago, um, I was in a meeting where a partner of a large firm um, said that it was very easy to set up a company in Switzerland. You didn't need anybody there. All you needed was a fax machine and a secretary, and all your sales could be made through Switzerland. Huge amounts of profit could be realized there, and you would lower your effective tax rate. And um, standing here today, it, it, it somewhat amuses me that anyone was taking him seriously. Uh, that was a very long time ago. Um, and we have moved so far beyond that world that um, it, it really that seems quite uh, historic now. Um, we all know that uh, nothing is going to be recognised for tax purposes unless there is the appropriate amount of substance in the new jurisdiction. But the question is, what amount of substance is the right amount of substance? Um, just to take one example, um, we build enormous platforms, software platforms, huge systems which do many things. They hold data, they provide for um, searches, they provide for customer access, they balance the load of the various um, uh, 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 servers and facilities we use. They do a thousand different things and they're immensely complex with millions of lines of code. So um, for such a system to be owned in a particular place, how many people do we think would need to be there? Well, we've given this a great deal of thought, and it turns out for some of these systems, they're all different, but for some of them, a very small number of people, perhaps a dozen people, are really responsible for all the high-level thinking that goes into the design of the functionality and the customer requirements and building something that adds all the value. All the other hundreds or thousands of people involved in the creation of the platform are carrying out services. Certainly the coding is a routine service. Many different service providers can provide that. The, the more detailed design, while not being a routine service, is still a service. And the people deciding exactly how to put the elements together, exactly how to build the database, these are not unique functions. It's the people at the top who are designing the overall architecture who are really responsible for that uh, platform. So in that case, I would say that if those dozen people were located in a particular jurisdiction in an IP holding and exploiting company, that is where it's owned. Well, I, I mean, I'd say that's a very interesting question. It probably depends on the IP. If it's IP which, once created, lasts forever, then the business of exploiting that IP is completely different from creating it. If, on the other hand, it's a kind of a IP asset which deteriorates over time, needs to be refreshed, or data needs to be renewed, or it needs to be adapted as customers change their behavior, uh, then I'd say that both skills are required in order for that to be a complete business. And the question is, if, if the people there are just um, the experts at exploiting the and licensing the asset, but don't have the skills to maintain the asset, then who owns what if the people maintaining the asset are based somewhere else? Um, well, uh, so I have an example which I think will, will illustrate some of the difficulties. Um, uh, this uh, is a business which um, uh, is a, manages a database, and let's say it's a database about um, uh, the air industry, the airline industry and passengers and flights and everything else. So um, this um, business collects data from all over the world, and its customers are very keen to have this data, so they provide the data free of charge. So in Sweden and Denmark, we have two third parties who happily provide their data at no cost to the editor of the database who sits in the UK in London, uh, let's say at Heathrow Airport. Um, now, a lot of data comes in in a very unstructured form, 
and we have some wonderful software which formats the data, converts it into a form which can be searched in the database. Every individual element is tagged um, and um, uh, lined up correctly in the database. And this is done by a center in the Philippines. Um, although the data itself is held, let's say, on a data center in the US where the servers are based. There's nothing there apart from the servers, but it just happens to be we have a lot of servers there and that's where the data is. The coding of all the software was done in India. Um, and the platform was actually developed by a team of people, 12 of them, as I was describing a moment ago, sitting in France, the world experts in building this kind of database. But the platform was paid for by five operating companies in the UK, the US, France, the Netherlands, and Japan. So it goes into the database. Uh, it's great, it's perfect, and now it's ready to be sold to the customer. And we decide that um, in order to centralize the contracting function, all customer contracts are entered into by the Dutch entity, and we have a big team of people sitting in Amsterdam who enter into contracts with customers. This particular customer um, is a business which is located in Italy, but they're growing their business in Japan. They have some people on secondment in Japan, and the person who is using the data is on holiday for a few weeks in Hawaii in the US. And our customer a sales office was in France, and they facilitated the sale to the Italian customer. Um, so uh, what's going on here from, tax, from a tax point of view? Um, uh, a, a few questions, really. Who, who owns the data? Um, is it perhaps uh, coming back to um, uh, the question about ownership of intangible assets. Uh, well, it was given free by the businesses in Sweden and Denmark, so I suppose they gave it up to the UK operating company and the person sitting in London. Um, and I suppose the fact that it's then been sort of made available through this rather complex, perhaps the data is owned in the UK. Um, where is the customer? Uh, is the customer in the US, Japan, or Italy? Um, and many people, in terms of the use of uh, uh, digital assets now, are talking about trying to tax profits where the digital product or service is being used. Um, the French th uh, theories, for example, about trying to tax the profits earned by a company like Amazon from its French customers say, well, let's look at where the customers are buying their e-books or searching for their goods. Uh, they're doing that in France, so somehow we should tax them there. Well, where is the customer here? Um, is the customer the Italian company or is it the individual who's really based in Japan or is it the fact that he is an individual used this data while he was in Hawaii that is relevant? Um, uh, no idea. I think these things need to be thought through. Um, and uh, to what extent is the data sort of economically owned by any other operating companies here? Um, they all benefit from the fact that we have the data. In fact, this product is only valuable because air-related customers all over the world supply their data free of charge, and therefore we have something which is useful to them. If they didn't supply their data, we'd have nothing that they would be willing to pay for. So well, some people might argue the value is being created here in Sweden and Denmark, and perhaps our UK operating company should pay some tax on its profits there. So uh, the, the question is, where is the customer? Who is the customer? Where is the customer using the service? We don't know necessarily, because if the, the individual in Hawaii was using his virtual private network, which came through Japan into the company's account in Italy, we might think he was actually in Italy. We didn't know that he was in Hawaii, we certainly didn't know that his uh, base was currently in Japan. Um, where should the revenue be recognized? Um, should it be the UK? Maybe they own the data, but then we need to somehow allocate between the other operations. Um, and how should the cost be allocated? How should the cost of developing the technology be amortized or allocated? There were five companies which shared in the cost. Um, so the platform we think is jointly owned and funded. Do we amortize the costs in those five countries, and if so, in which proportion? And how many PEs are there? Are there digital PEs and other PEs? Well, um, we touched, I think, a little earlier on a question about um, significant people functions and where they are. In this particular example, um, where is the significant people function? Because you could argue that every single thing here is a, is a, is a subsidiary service except for that one person who sits in the UK and manages the whole process and collects all the data. So is this a business model where the significant people function consists of one person sitting in London? Um, and if so, what happens if he decides that uh, the weather is too bad in London and he wants to live in Italy and he goes to work in Italy? Has there been 
a, uh, a transfer of goodwill, uh, dog, cat, rabbit, any other kind of goodwill, or other intangible assets from the UK to Italy, or is there a permanent establishment in Italy? And uh, the answer to all of those questions is that I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so who owns the platform, uh, in which proportion? Um, what if one of these operating companies has been paying its share for five years and then it finds that actually the customers are different in, let's say, Japan? They don't need this platform anymore. Uh, it's no use to them and they don't want it. So do they no longer have an entitlement to use it? Is there a buyout transaction required? Or are they still part owners and should they therefore receive some of the revenues going forward? I think we can see why this will be difficult um, looking into the future because every one of these taxing jurisdictions might have arguments for taxing some of the profits attributable to the IP. Even Sweden and Denmark, as we said, uh, certainly the US, perhaps Japan. Um, and here we're saying that uh, if people move uh, more than one jurisdiction may feel that they have some ownership of the significant people function. Um, just to finish on, on the digital side and one other point in intangible assets is that um, uh, many intangible assets are enhanced and improved by customer behaviour. We know this, that when we go onto Amazon, then the next time we come back, the fact that we were searching for one thing means that it's starting to offer us something different. Um, which obviously can be embarrassing when other members of the family start to look at what you've been searching for. Um, but in our case, um, digital products, um, uh, sort of search uh, products, can be enhanced as customers carry out searches in particular ways. And some of these systems can learn um, uh, according to the way in which customers have been behaving to provide a, a more focused search result to customers who come along later. So where the user, who may be all over the place, in one of any number of countries, is adding value to the system, where is the intangible being created and where is the value being added? Um, I'll, I'll leave some more questions perhaps to look at, at leisure. Um, and again, I, I think perhaps I'm running a little short on time. Do you want to leave some time for, for discussion as well? So I'll just say very briefly that in the case of joint development of some of these platforms, where it can take years, even decades, to go through long development cycles and enhancement, um, there are very difficult questions to be addressed as to how the cost sharing should work, um, how amortization of costs should be applied. And I think it's, it's unfortunate that in the OECD work on intangibles, as part of the transfer pricing guidelines, um, they decided to leave out any discussion of cost contribution arrangements or cost sharing in relation to intangibles um, on the basis that it was actually too difficult. Um, the plan is that they'll come back to cost sharing at a later stage in the process. And I think these are the questions that will then need to be addressed. Um, well, just to finish off, but, uh, but please stop me if there are any more questions, um, I, I'd included a couple of thoughts about uh, documentation. Um, it's essential to have contemporaneous documentation because things change so fast, people move, um, we'll never capture the subtleties and the nuances of some of these business models and the business thinking unless we capture them in real time, both the business rationale and the purpose. And these need to be produced by people in the business with real business knowledge. It's very interesting if you ask in some of our businesses, where is the value really created? Is it on the platforms? Is it in the content? Is it in the brand and the customer facing side of the business? Well, of course, if you ask the technology people, it's all in the platforms and the algorithms. And if you ask the editors and the content aggregators, it's all in the content. And if you ask the brand people, well, a good chunk of it is in the brand. And we as tax professionals and tax authorities need to step back from this and apply quite a critical eye to forming our own views about overall where the value is really created. And of course, the truth is very hard to be specific. Um, and value is created in all of these areas. And the allocation between them is, is extremely judgmental. We need to include uh, economic analysis. And uh, I think that there is a great deal of merit in appropriate cases in discussing these issues at a very early stage with tax authorities. In some cases, before the project has even been implemented, while it's still in the design and the development stage, we can start to assess the, the potential views of the tax authority, uh, where they see the big issues, perhaps where the thought may be required in terms of the, the documentation um, and the design of the, the structure. But certainly once the project has been implemented, uh, and even perhaps before the tax return is submitted, there is merit in opening the dialogue with tax authorities where that's the customary thing to do. Um, misunderstandings creep in all the time because of the different perspectives and different ways in which people see things, uh, mischaracterization. 
Um, one of the common misconceptions I find among business people is that um, they feel that where revenue is received is where it should be taxed. Now, of course, where the revenue is received in a very joined up multinational could be quite different from where the revenue is earned. So maybe we have a cash collection center. There are a few people who feel that that's where the profits should be taxed, which is clearly nonsense. It could be that we have a company selling, in the, uh, selling on an, um, um, a, a, as the undisclosed agent for other companies, in which case we know where the profits should be taxed and the revenues should be allocated, but we'll need to work with the businesses to make sure that's done correctly. And uh, just very briefly, where people uh, express incorrect views in emails, um, they are impossible to delete, as we know. They're always somewhere in the servers. And I think they need to be corrected by an explanatory or corrective email to make sure that the story is put right. So documentation, uh, a real challenge, a very important part of any project. Um, but I think it can be done with the help of, uh, of constructive business people. We can set out the business case and the rationale very clearly, very articulately, and put it down in good time. Um, how to avoid disputes about these issues? Uh, well, of course, we can't because reasonable people can disagree uh, about so many of these issues. But I think the collaborative working or the uh, horizontal Zicht in the Netherlands or the, uh, um, uh, the, 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 the low risk relationship uh, in the UK, um, the compliance assurance program in the US, I do think that all of these offer opportunities to work to a greater or lesser extent in real time in a collaborative way with tax authorities to address these very difficult issues. Um, I've included a, a short word about working with advisors. Um, and although it can be very expensive, um, we, we, we find it obviously very worthwhile to work with the right advisors, um, people who um, work with us in a, in a collaborative way with the ideas which align with ours. And we find we need to work with advisors. These are very complex areas. They require many disciplines. Um, and having a, a team of the right advisors who can work together among themselves as well is quite critical to our success. Um, if we think something may de be disputed, we'd want to reflect on whether we should prepare for the possibility of litigation at the outset by having appropriate legal representation, by having the appropriate documentation in place. Now, we don't ever want litigation to be an outcome. It's just that if it's a possibility, for example, it may be a new point of law. And it may be in a very friendly and collaborative way. A tax authority might say, look, we're sorry. <laughs> we think we may have to test this because we don't know what the answer is, and it's very important. And if both sides feel that they have a legitimate point of view, who knows where it might go. Um, equally, though, I think alternative dispute resolution techniques are particularly useful in relation to IP-related transactions, where uh, either arbitrators or facilitators can help both sides view these very complex transactions in slightly different ways. And all the usual project planning techniques are important when working on these projects with advisors, having clear objectives, having a budget, project plan, stage gates, etc., etc. Well, that's all I wanted to say, but very happy to um, uh, have any more discussion. In fact, delighted to, and hopefully you'll be able to help me answer some of these rather difficult questions.